Well, Twelfth Night is indeed a perennial favorite. It's uh, among Shakespeare's comedies. It's probably not the most produced, but it's um, the comedy that um, I think has the most um, gravitas, maybe too wrong a word, but it has a, it has a real substance to it. Um, it has a melancholy that flows through the play. There's, there's musical elements in the play. It's a, it's a late comedy. Um, it's not as dark as some of his Jacobean comedies that were written once James I became king in 1604 or so, but Twelfth Night's around 1601, I think somewhere right around there. Um, and it's a play that uh, there's kind of a wonderful melancholy to the play. And so it has a... It's a it's a mature comedy. I guess that's maybe that's the best way to put it. So it has a, a pretty broad appeal. Um, some people, you know, prefer Midsummer Night's Dream as one of the great comedies. Uh, Much Ado About Nothing is is like Twelfth Night is a little more mature. But um, Twelfth Night has music in it. It has wonderful clowns. It has this great s story of um, uh, the comeuppance of Malvolio, the the Puritan prig head head butler or uh, servant of Olivia's household who um, oversteps his um, his position in some in some ways and is uh, then given a comeuppance. Um, but uh, it also has this wonderful clown of Feste, who is a, a later clown. And Feste is a, um, a darker clown, uh, a fool that gives advice, but also is always pointing people in the right direction uh, in terms of um, where they might want to think about um, heading their lives um, and, and it has the um, like as you like it it has a the woman's role who dresses up as a boy uh, which is always a fun thing in Shakespeare because the as we know the Shakespeare's plays were done by all male casts and the women were played by young boys so he had the free a number of plays in his in his in the canon that uh, had a, a young boy playing a young woman in the course of the acting process, but then the young woman in the play dresses up as a young boy. Um, some people feel that was a way for him to kind of let get the boys off the hook and not have to play women all the time, uh, which was a certain talent that you had or you didn't. Um, but it also, uh, um, like a lot of those plays, uh, played with the gender. Uh, balance of the play. And this is one of the things we're looking at in our current production of Twelfth Night to explore the sense of gender in, in a modern dress production of the play. Um, but it it is a perennial favorite. Again, it's not as probably not as popular as Midsummer Night's Dream. That's probably the most popular. Comedy of Errors is up there too, although that's really just a, a, a very farcical play and, uh, and a hard play to do in its own way. Uh, but Twelfth Night, I think, is much more accessible in terms of the, the broader range of characters, the comedy and the, and the romance that is contained within the play, um, give it a, a much wider range of appeal. So it's, it's one that's off, often, often on the, the short list of Shakespeare comedies that get done by any uh, Shakespeare festival. It's also as a relatively contained cast. You can do it with about uh, 14 people. Uh, we're doing it with 12, I think, right now in terms of the IU production. So uh, it has many things going for it uh, from a producer's point of view, which um, is also one of the things you keep in mind when you're producing it. Well, yes, uh, the transition from doing a production that was meant to be for the stage uh, into a virtual world is a brand new one for me. And, you know, one of the things I say, you know, frequently I, I hear at my age is that as you get older, you should try new things. So this is a brand new thing for me to try in terms of working on a production that's going to be all rehearsed online and performed in a streaming platform online. Um, the transition, I, uh, on some level, has not occurred yet. We're doing rehearsals online. And there's the main difference of that, obviously, is you're not in the same room. So you're not working on the physicality of staging the play. Um, and with a Shakespeare play, um, the staging is certainly important. But you do, we do spend a lot of time with the Shakespeare play working on the language, working on the text, making sure the text is clear and, and well articulated and, and well intentioned and, and played by the actors that are involved with the production. Um, the benefit of this virtual production is we're, getting to, we're going to get to spend a, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot more time doing that kind of work. Um, which is great for the university students. Uh, I have a good group of graduate students who are involved with the production who have a good head start on it already. 
and uh, the undergraduates that are involved um, are also very game for it. So there's a, there's a lot of spend uh, a lot of benefit to spending time on the text uh, with the cast in in this way. Uh, what we do miss is the, the the reality of the theater, which is we're in the, a room together creating a story. Uh, with this particular group of actors for a particular audience with a particular play particular designers and it's all it's a it's a, as many times as we might have worked on a play each play is unique and it's in that particular construction so um, the the big and the big change or switch or difference for this process has yet to really happen because we're, we're still trying to figure out with the design team how do we take the play that we're working on in a, a virtual rehearsal process and put it into some form that's going to be entertaining and palatable and clear and understandable uh, for an audience online? And that that is a particular challenge that uh, many people in, in this in the pandemic have had to work on. And it's a new one for me. So um, I'm not sure I've answered that question entirely, but. Uh, the process is ongoing at the moment. So if, uh, if you talk to me in about six weeks, maybe I'll have a different answer for you. But right now it's, it's, it's interesting, it's exciting, uh, it's a wonderful challenge uh, for all of us involved. And a number of the students have already done uh, some online performing and, and rehearsing, so they have a, a, a leg up on me in that regard. But we're putting it together um, one step at a time, and I'm, I'm really enjoying the process so far. Uh, when we get into tech, we'll see. We'll see how much I enjoy it then when I can't really go up and talk to the actors and make it all make the scene work physically. But that's where we are. Well, yes, the full title of the play is Twelfth Night or What You Will. Um, there's a couple other of his plays that have um, secondary titles or subtitles like that. I think the, the main one that comes to mind is, is a much later play. It's one of his last plays, Henry VIII, uh, which is subtitled All Is True. And uh, scholars actually dig a lot more into that subtitle in terms of what it might mean having to do with um, the the rejection by Henry VIII of Catholicism in the play, uh, in, in, in history. And that, and that had something to do with uh, Shakespeare's potentially his family being originally Catholic, but that's a whole nother subject we won't get into. Twelfth Night or What You Will as a comedy, um, we, we rarely see that Twelfth Night, uh, the What You Will part of the title in print. It, it, it's rarely, I mean, I'm looking at the cover of the Arden Shakespeare right now, and it just says Twelfth Night. The, uh, the Pelican Shakespeare says Twelfth Night. So you won't even see What You Will on, on the front piece of a, of, a, of a scripted edition. You might see it on the inside. I'm trying to remember if it's on the inside or not uh, when you get to the title page. Um, but for our production, the, 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 we're doing this production very modern dress, uh, and, and it's, it's being played by students, young people, um, some of whom are in their 30s, some are younger, um, but they're uh, of a certain generation. And uh, there's a phrase that, I've, that you know, has been around for a long time, which uh, comes in and out of vogue, and, and I talked to the cast about this early on, that what you will also has a, a feeling to me of whatever whatever um and there's a certain comic element to that about the plays about this 12th night and 12th night is even a, a, a fairly enigmatic title in itself because it has nothing to do with christmas it has nothing to do with the 12 days of christmas or the 12th night of christmas other than that there was some uh some sense of that during the christmas season the 12th night was the final night of christmas and there was a kind of a, a topsy-turvy lords of misrule that came and the fools in the world kind of took over and ran the ran the world for a day or a night and there's some tradition in, in pagan cultures of that going on but also in in early christianity um but that title 12th night is is it makes as much sense as what you will in terms of what the play is about uh although what you will in some ways is a perfect is a good subtitle for almost any good comedy because you make of the story what you will of it and uh, what you you make out of it what you will. And it's um, it has an open ended theme to it. And uh, for our production, I, I think uh, because we're also playing with the, the gender roles in the play, um, there's a there's an ambiguity to it. What you will, what your will, uh, what you will desire, what you will want, what you will become um, or whatever you will. What, what do you want? 
Um, so I think that's part that's part of the fun of the subtitle to me. Um, there's lots of you know if you're interested in this, you can really kind of dig into the the Shakespearean dramaturgy about what that subtitle means. But it's it's really uh, it's a bit a bit of an enigma, enigma in some ways in terms of what that means. But for our for our purposes, it, it kind of comes down to uh, it's a comedy of whatever. <laughs> 